my name is Dr. Jeff McNary. I'm the Chief Medical Officer here at Rhythmia, and I have a doctorate in psychology and a master's in public health that I got when I was in grad school at UCLA. Beautiful. Jeff, thanks for spending time with me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's quite, I'm happy to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm so fascinated by really the psychology side of things of all stuff to start with. Like I'm yeah. a, a big, in, in my practice, in my business, you know, coaching, and I hate that term, but I don't know what else to call it. Yeah. Right, have dove so deep into psychology as a whole. For sure. Right, like the work of Jung and work of uh-huh. like, uh, getting the spiral dynamics and yeah. things like that. And just Good. love to see the intercorrelation here, how that plays into all the stuff that goes on here, right? Because yeah, for you, sure. You get the, I get to speak medical with you yeah. and spiritual. Yeah, both. Which is beautiful. Yeah, it's kind of rare to have it, both of those in one sort of place. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So what, what do you see, right, as we start talking psychology and what people are going through here and what that looks like as it pertains to the plant medicine, mm-hmm. right, and some of the, you know, the access to higher consciousness, yeah. the sub, like however we look at it, uh-huh. what is going on? On, I'll say more of a, I cringe to say clinical setting. Yeah, like more scientific side. Yeah. Right? Well, it's really interesting because, you know, a lot of the people that come here have trauma. And it might be recent trauma. A lot of it's from childhood. And what happens with people that have trauma, you know, in a traditional sort of psychological environment, but like back in the West, they have to be in a lot of therapy. And people that have trauma often have drug and alcohol issues or they have anxiety, depression. It manifests in all these different ways. So I think trauma is the root cause of a lot of stuff. And what happens in trauma, you know, like if somebody has something horrible happen to them, like let's say they were abused as a kid, during those years of abuse, um, the emotions that a kid would feel at that time are too overwhelming for the kid to bear. And it's, it's like a, it's almost like an instinctive thing to kind of block those emotions out and push them aside. And we can relate to this as adults. Like if we see a car accident, that's really bad. All of a sudden we become sort of numb and we just start to behave and kind of either help or survive. And the emotions are kind of put on hold. What happens with those emotions is they get pushed into a part of the brain called the amygdala. That's where we store all of our subconscious memories. And if there's a lot of memories there that are traumatic, so if you think about what trauma memories might be like, right? It's like there's fear, there's shame, there's guilt, there's anger, all these things, right? And if those get stuffed in the amygdala for a long time, they start to creep out into our prefrontal cortex, which is our consciousness and our sort of our rational thinking part of the brain. And then they influence our life. And we're not really sure like why we're making certain decisions or what we're doing, why we keep picking poor relationships, you know, and we have a certain kind of vibe of maybe depression or, or anxiety, right? So what happens It's you know, the way to kind of unlock that stuff and get past it is to do trauma therapy. That's kind of like what happens in the West. And like I said earlier, it's, it's very time consuming and it's hard to build trust and rapport with a clinician that you see sometimes, you know, once a week or once a month, it's really hard to do that kind of work. It's scary. So the beauty of plant medicine and especially ayahuasca that we use at Rhythmia, right? Is that it unlocks the, the subconscious brain, the amygdala, and you have connection with your prefrontal cortex. So what happens is all those emotions kind of like they surface during a ceremony during a plant medicine session, right? And they come up and there's fear and there's anger and there's all this stuff. And it's kind of like weird in the, in the moment because people are like, well, I'm not angry. Like the, everything in my life seems to be okay, but I, I feel this anger. And then they don't really understand maybe what's going on. They get a little confused. So that's where the integration that we do in the, the talk, you know, the sessions that we do with people here afterwards help to understand like that's historical stuff. That's historical anger. And then what happens is you have this awareness like, wow, you know, that makes sense to me. I don't have this traumatic emotional baggage anymore. It's I've processed it because I felt it. It's moved through me. It's happened really quick. And now I have some new awareness that I, I'm like, you know, I can, I can be vulnerable in a relationship now because it doesn't mean I'm going to die. Like it used to mean when I was five, right? (laughs) And uh, the synaptic plasticity component of the brain, which means that new neuron pathways can get established and sort of new connections can be made. It means that the brain is not rigid like used to be thought years ago. 
it can morph and adjust. What that means is that there's new neuron pathways getting established and neurochemistry is getting reset in the brain during the plant medicine session. So that's basically the scientific side of this. It's really cool. Well, I love that because I've, I've adopted or, you know, and, and if I'm wrong, I, I want to hear that I'm wrong. Like I don't have an ego when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> but in the work that I've either done on myself or helped other people with, it seems like our brains are always wired for efficiency, right? So you have yeah. that initial traumatic experience and anything that mirrors that, I call it a trauma trough way. Like uh-huh. you literally, you, you're processing it, even if it's not as bad, if it triggers the same a, a threat response, yeah, essentially it brings up that old memory. Definitely. Right. And so it's, you're, you're living this consistent pattern cycle of the things that are going on in the real time yeah. and everybody wants to put the bandaid on, well, you know, I'm mad at my wife because of this. Yeah. But I, we track it back far enough and it always seems like somewhere between what, two and 10, two and 12. Absolutely. There's something that has created that belief system. Yes. That then is manifesting itself in the current day moment. Totally. That's perfectly right on the money. Okay. That's exactly what's happening. It's crazy. Some of those, <laughs> some of those psychology books I've read are yeah. actually sticking somewhere. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. And I love the fact of the, the explanation about how ayahuasca works, right? Because I think for me, there was this, gosh, I don't even know how to say it, you know, stigma around ayahuasca. Like, sure. The, you know, what is it? How is it going to work? Like, it yeah. was, you know, tripping balls or, you know, yeah. whatever they're doing. And, and it's just like this more of, I'll call it a hedonistic experience when it's yeah, really that, not like this is, it is and it's not right. The, correct. The rhythmic beating of the drums, some of the things that we experience, like there's something so powerful about that. There is. But it's also the fact of this is really deep work. Like you said, it's almost like condensing down years of therapy sessions yeah. into a six hour time window. Definitely. That's what I love about it. You know, cause in back in LA, my patient population was super high risk people, mm-hmm. mostly addicts and people with trauma, mostly women that have been victimized. That was a big part of my practice. I also worked with acute psychiatric people. So I worked with all the people that kind of society says, oh, there's nothing we can do for them. Just put a bandaid on it and just hope for the best. Those were my people, you know, that I worked with for 25 years and uh, not as a psychology person at that, you know, that was when I was 19, I started doing it. Right. So that was like a counseling level, but it it evolved. Right. So um, it's really interesting because, you know, those people, they don't, we don't have 20 years to do therapy with those kind of people because they're going to die. Mm-hmm. They're going to commit suicide. They're going to overdose on drugs. They're going to be miserable in their life. So that's what I love about the plant medicine. It's so fast. You can like resolve stuff really quick, you know? Yeah. Walk me back to that. Like I'm, I'm curious about the days cause you, I mean, that's how you met Jerry. Yeah. Right. Was but Palisades or? passages passages in yep. Malibu. Yeah. I was the administrative director of that rehab and I wasn't taking patients, you know, I was just running the facility. But I, re- I realized real quick when I did his intake assessment that, you know, he was a, a tough guy and he would have been pretty rough. And I didn't, I didn't really want to turn him over to my treatment team completely. I did have him work with some of the therapists there, but I decided I was going to kind of talk to this guy every day. He was here to kind of keep him on track. And it was like really, really cool because he did great. And he's, he has a drive that's insane. Like he's really wants to succeed at something when he puts his mind to it. Mm -hmm. And that's how we met uh, almost 10 years ago. You know, was it passages? That's so wild. Yeah. And then how long was, how long was that relationship before all this? Right. When you go back to the passages days Yeah. and he was there, what's that timetable? What's some of the, well, I had him at passages for two months. And then after that, he moved to LA, he moved to Malibu down the road from the rehab and he still wanted to talk to me. And so I said, all right, fine. So I did. And we talked and hung out and did sort of coaching sort of work with him and like guidance sort of counseling for five years. And you know, I, I had a, an agenda, which was, I just didn't want this dude to kill himself because I met his family when he was at passages. They were very cool. His boys were young. He has two boys. They were 19 and 17, I think, or even younger. And, uh, I met his wife and they were all just awesome people, you know, and, and he was on a self-destructive mission. So, you know, I was trying to work with him and give him some pointers and try to process stuff with him. But the reality was I was just trying to keep him alive, hoping that something would come along and shift him. But there was nothing that would work. You know, he tried everything, all the holistic stuff, all the therapeutic stuff. He went to agape. Just mm-hmm. nothing was working. So what's that like from from your position to have someone come across your plate that, 
not that we can we can't I don't think fix anybody right I don't think any of us are inherently broken from the way that yeah. I view life yeah but you have this person that you you obviously had experienced a lot of success in helping yeah shift people's perspective totally and here you have someone coming in that you're like right now the best thing I can do is just make sure he doesn't die yeah exactly yeah it was it was very awkward in a lot of ways yeah. for me because I'm like what am I even doing with this dude mm -hmm. you know like we would talk and he'd say things about his childhood, but nothing was really connecting. And I, I was out of tools. I didn't know what else to do, you know? And so I was getting frustrated as well, you know? And the, the beauty of the whole process was there was something kind of hinting at me that's like, don't give up on this dude. There's something going on. Just be patient was kind of the, the vibe that I had inside of me. I didn't know why, mm -hmm. you know, I had no clue. I had learned in my years of working with people that if I follow my intuition, it's usually pretty helpful for me. Mm -hmm. And I've learned that when I don't, it's not so great. So I decided, all right, cool. I'll just kind of hang out with this for a bit and see what happens. And that's when um, he was recommended to go try plant medicine by somebody that I knew that referred him to a place in Costa Rica. And he just, you know, he took the challenge and went for it. And I was like, okay, dude, whatever. Like, you know, I've heard about plant medicine. I just didn't know much about it at the time. I'd seen some documentaries, read a little bit. But I was like, hey, I'm willing to support anything that could possibly help you, you know? Yeah. So we went and did it. And that's that's how that happened. So I'm all over the place right now. As, as we talk about this side of, of life and what plant medicine can do, right in the U.S. right now, we're seeing what MDMA start to become yeah. potential legalized, psilocybin yeah. start to become legalized. Yeah. Some things to help treat depression, anxiety. Ketamine. Yeah. Ketamine. Yeah. What are your thoughts on all that? Like, I think it's great. I think it's amazing because a lot of those meds, a lot of those substances started off in a therapeutic sort of protocol setting. And then uh, for various reasons, probably some of them that has taken away pharmaceutical industries money. And also it was turning into sort of like people could use it recreationally and it, government doesn't usually like that kind of stuff and it was kind of getting black market vibe to it and so they just shut it down you know so to see it come back with the right clinical studies being done and, and done in the right environments for the right reasons i think is amazing i'm totally behind it 100 percent. yeah I, I love it i mean but for me psilocybin was the first thing right up i'm not yeah. steroid sure I'm, that was that was my bag for a long time yeah as far as pot and all that never really cared and yeah uh, psilocybin for me about a year ago, maybe a little bit less. Uh -huh. I'm just seeing like, man, there is something so different from that. And that's like just a tip of the iceberg from what ayahuasca yeah. ends up really being. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the thing about those, those substances is that the side effects are minimal if, if any, mm -hmm. and they don't drag out, you know, the med protocols, like with, with psychiatric meds, like SSRIs for depression, you know, people are on those things for years and they have all these horrible side effects. The, it wears out its use. They have to switch to another one. I mean, I used to do med management in LA for all my patients. That, you know, I worked with this, with their psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and I would see people on dozens of meds at a time. It was just crazy. You know, none of them were getting any better. You know, it was just it was crazy. So having these other substances come around and be used clinically and for the right reasons, I think is amazing. I love it. I'm totally a fan. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so jumping back into Jerry comes down for yep. a boga. Yep. How long has he gone for? And when he comes back, do you instantly realize like there's something different with this guy? <laughs> Is it like still fucking crazy? Like how, how does how does that work? Well, I knew on the phone when he called me after the, he called me a couple of days after he'd done it, he was still in Costa Rica. I was like, something's wrong and not wrong, but different with this dude. There's something going on. He sounds calm. There's something about him. And then as soon as he got home, like he was only here like a week. Mm hmm. He went back to Malibu and I showed up at his pad and I could just tell walking up to him that he was totally different. He was grounded. He wasn't all over the place like he used to be. He just was plugged into himself. I noticed it immediately. That's so, it so, was shocking, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> and so we'll fast forward, obviously, this uh, Jerry's story with the moon and all that stuff and yeah. what brought Rhythmia to be. Yeah. Eventually, he springs on you. Hey, I'm buying a resort in Costa Rica. Well, I, after he did it, he wanted me to come down and do it. So I did it like two weeks or so later, mm -hmm. like after him. How was your first experience? Incredible. Yeah. yeah, it was incredible. And I wasn't expecting much because I'd done a lot of work on myself. To get your doctorate in psychology, you got to have about 65 hours of individual therapy for yourself while you're in the program. You have to make sure you're not totally nuts if you're going to be working with people, right? Yeah. So... <laughs> 
and I, I had uh, done a lot of work on myself. I felt that I was okay, good enough. You know, I, you know, of course, everybody's got issues. I knew I had issues, but nothing like I thought was, you know, so horrible. So I was like, all right, I'll try this, but I don't know what I'm going to get out of it. So I was really nervous. Never done anything like that before. Never done psilocybin at that point, nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, I'll just do it. So I did it and it completely changed my life. hundred percent. What, well, I, I, I got to know, like, <laughs> yeah. can you share what that, sure. what changed, what you got out of yeah. it, what, what all that was? I grew up in a rough area of Los Angeles at the time. Now it's not so rough where I live, where I grew up, but it is, it was then. And I had to protect myself. I was the oldest of seven kids. I had to look out for my siblings. I had to look out for my friends. There was a lot of bad stuff going on in my neighborhood. There was a lot of gangs. There was a lot of drugs, a lot of violence. It was a low income area. It was just brutal. Northeast Los Angeles area. And uh, so I had to have this persona as a little kid, probably five years old. I started acting this way. I was a tough guy. Don't mess with me. Stay away. I'll kick your ass. You know, I was like aggro as a kid mm -hmm. and as a young adult, too. And I learned that it kept me safe. You know, it kept me from from getting into too much trouble. People would stay away from me. And any scuffles I got into, I'd always win. So it was just kind of like it worked for me. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't my authentic self. That wasn't who I really was. I wasn't some big, mean, tough guy who was trying to scare everybody. I was actually really sensitive and really uh, a loving person. But I just wasn't really in tune with that part of me. I was having success. I was going to school. I was had a family, whatever. But I was still kind of like uneasy. And I was angry a lot. And the plant medicine showed me all this. And it showed me that. You know, that was something I needed back then to have that persona, but it's not something I need now because I'm not five, six, seven years old trying to survive in the street, working with, you know, hanging out with all these crazy people. I'm, I'm now an adult. I can choose where I go, and what I do. I don't need to have this. So I dropped it. I completely dropped that whole facade and really plugged into myself. And I got to, you know, my family immediately noticed my friends did. I got married. You know, like I would have never done that. I got married once. I was divorced, but I said, I'm never getting married again. Like, screw this. Right. But I was like, no, I, I, I can connect with people now. Like mm -hmm. it was just like an amazing thing. It would help me a lot. That's beautiful. That's Thank so, you. That's so crazy to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so you go through the experience. I got to know when, when is the shift of Jerry like tapping on the shore? Like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Like, when does that come? Yeah, well, do you mean as far as... It rid me. Yeah, well, this is what happened. So the place we went to was such a piece of crap. It was like this house in the middle of nowhere up mm -hmm. in the mountains. And it, and it was just like dirty and the food sucked. And it just The medicine was amazing. The shaman's skill was amazing. But everything else was horrible. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> we really thought that people could benefit from plant medicine. And we knew that the only real way to access it was in these kind of junky sort of places that are rogue that are around, that are around the world or going into the, the indigenous communities in Peru and, you know, South America where it's a little rough, you know, some places are great, but it's a little rustic, you know, and it can be dangerous mm -hmm. and people can get taken advantage of. And there's places that are amazing and totally cool, but how do you know what those are? You know, so we heard a lot of horror stories about places, right? So we wanted to have a place where people could come and feel comfortable and they could have all the medical support that they needed, that they're used to having in the West. So we have medical doctors and nurses and we have counselors and all these people. And we're at a resort, you know, it's a beautiful place. It's in a nice area, safe place. Costa Rica is safe in general, but this is a really safe place that we're located right by the beach. I mean, we just want to have something that was that would be inviting to people that really need the healing. Because people that venture off into Peru or wherever, the Amazon, you know, they're, they need healing too, but they're often more adventurous and they're kind of already in that zone of being open-minded to some degree. We want to get the, the CEO single mom from Sandusky, Ohio that would never go to Peru. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like we want, or, or, you know, or a kid, you know, an 18 year old who's been inner city struggling, you know, the world's against them. We want those people that would never be able to go or make it to Peru. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how that started. So it was, it was pretty quickly after we did the plant medicine the first time within the same year we bought Jerry bought Rhythmia. Yeah. And so you had to, at some point tell your wife, girlfriend, fiance, yeah. 
hey, by the way, what do you think about moving to Costa Rica? <laughs> exactly. Like LA your whole life, give or My take. My whole life, yeah. And all of a sudden, it's, we're going to go to a whole other country. How was that conversation? Yeah, it was a li- you know, it was, it was a little rough. Um, <laughs> I wasn't married at the time, but I was close. And so I was kind of like, you know what, I'm, let's go. And she was like, well, I'm finishing up my doctorate program in forensic psych. I need to get my hours. I need to do this. I'm like, all right, well, you stay in LA and I'll be down here. I'll just go back and forth. So I did that for like a year and that was too hard. So she said, you know what, like, I'm not okay with my daughter going to school in LA and having to take active shooter drills to like not get shot by somebody. (laughs) So let's, let's move. And it was her idea to come down. So she came down and it worked out, man. Yeah. Just just, that easy. Yeah. It was, I was was lucky. Yeah. Yeah, Cause it could have been hard. (laughs) And you said that was about five years ago now. Well, she came down, uh, two and a half years ago. Okay. But I, so I was here solo for a couple years, you know, yeah. Before that. Yeah, I've, I've been here five years. As soon as we bought the place, I moved here because I had to start working with the government to get this place medically licensed with the Ministry of Health. Mm-hmm. Jerry was helping, of course. He was leading the charge. But I was like writing the program, talking with our attorneys, submitting paperwork to the Ministry of Health and just doing a bunch of stuff. And it took like two years or so to get that going. So I was living on the property alone. Nobody else lived here, just me. And we had a couple skeleton crew like a groundskeeper and Jorge, our manager was here and had a couple others and that was it. And they'd go home, you know, and I'd be here solo all night, you know, for, for, for two years. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Nobody else. Here. What, so what did the resort look like when you guys first bought it? I mean, was it, it was similar to this. Um, we didn't have the yoga deck or the, the ceremony area that mm-hmm. was just open. Yeah. Um, we did some renovations to the rooms and you know, we fixed up a lot of stuff, but it was pretty much looked like this and pretty generally. Okay. Yeah. What, how, what a phenomenal time. Like to think about being here in this entire compound by yourself for essentially two years. It was wild. I did a lot of surfing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. It was cool. I learned a lot because, um, you know, my master's in public health was in health policy development and program and sort of legal stuff with healthcare. Mm-hmm. So I knew how to like, could, like build a program and to like submit things. So it was perfect. You know, I, I've been trained how to do that for years at UCLA. It's so phenomenal to me that divine orchestration of all the things you had to go through to get to the moment of this. It's wild. I would have never, in the moment when I was studying, I didn't know what the heck I was even studying those things for. You know, I was anthropology undergrad, studied medical anthropology, Latin American ethnobotany studies. (laughs) Riveting. (laughs) Sounds riveting to me. And I was just like, I don't know what I'm doing with this. Maybe I'll get a doctorate in, in medical anthro. So I got into a couple schools after that and I was like, I don't want to be a researcher my whole life. So I'll go get a master's in public health. So I started doing research at UCLA and in uh, prenatal diagnostic screenings and worked in the OBGYN departments and ran the clinic there and did all kinds of different cool stuff. And then I'll go to medical school. So I applied to medical school. I got into uh, one school that I'm like, screw this. I don't want to do this. So I moved to Hawaii. So I worked for the department of health, managed all these Hawaiian families with uh, usually addiction issues. Mm-hmm. And I said, I want to get a doctorate in psych so I can actually diagnose people as opposed to just working underneath somebody. So when got my doctorate and then all just led to this, you know? Yeah. Passages included like being the director there. I was in grad school when I was running that place. That's so crazy. Yeah. So that if I look backwards, I see the whole, you know, the whole string of things leading to this being the perfect scenario for me. Mm -hmm. But in the time I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just cruising, you know, one thing to the next, like whatever. I love it. (laughs) $250,000 Two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt, ah, <laughs> student loans. Who's counting? Yeah, yeah, who cares? Yeah, it's only money. <laughs> Doesn't really exist. That's right. <laughs> so, talking about the plant medicine for you, right? As far as ayahuasca, your journeys with that. How often do you do it now? I mean, I just had to spend time with Jerry and realize he's a uh, you know once a week, once every other yeah. week. He says two hundred and some odd yeah. journeys into this. Well, once I did ayahuasca about maybe ten or twelve times for myself, mm-hmm. then I started doing it. Um, to kind of test the different sort of blends to see what's going to work best with the guests. Mm-hmm. And I did it another maybe 30 times. And after that, I haven't done it since. So it's been about two years since I haven't done it. I'm also on call for these sessions at night. Uh, so if somebody has to talk to somebody or is having a little moment, mm-hmm. the staff will let me know and I'll show up, you know, up there during the session and kind of make sure everything's cool. Yeah. But uh, I'm rarely needed, you know, because the medicine's really good and safe and the shaman staff are awesome. So it's rare that I even go up there, but I am on call. So I haven't really, I don't really participate when we have guests here. Of course. 
Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. One well, that was the next perfect segue to the next question, right? There's this thought for someone potentially listening, like I'm going to come down. What happens if I freak out? What happens? Like now I'm a whopping three sessions in, right? It's not like I'm a seasoned professional, but yeah. there's really I, I haven't seen anybody. Sometimes people get a little, you know, anxious or scared about something, but you know, it's it's short lived. Mm-hmm. You know, it passes really quick. We have about twelve staff up there every night, roughly depending on how many guests are here. Mm-hmm. Then we have a, an emergency medical technician that's walking around the, the area all night. We have an ambulance with two medical doctors sitting in it all night. We also have our medical director, Arturo, Dr. Arturo, who lives on the property, who's on call. Then I live about maybe one minute from here, and I'm on call. And there's two guest services staff that are up all night, chilling at the front desk and just supervising. So there's a lot of staff. There's a ton of staff that are ready to roll. But nobody's ever really needed. It's actually kind of a boring thing for the staff. They're just sitting there letting the guests do their thing. Yeah. Go through their experience, you know? And we are certainly all going through our own experience. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. You know, it's right. And if something like you're to say to answer your question, like if somebody says, well, what if I freak out or whatever? You know, there's ways to kind of de escalate people, you know, that are that are safe. Like giving them some water even, talking to them, just make sure they're okay, get the staff around them, make sure everything's fine, you know? So it's, no, you know, the reason why a lot of people at Rhythmia don't freak out is because everybody's medically cleared before they even get here. Yeah. You know, so if anybody that has like serious psychiatric issues isn't gonna be appropriate for our program. And if they have meds that they're on, they have to come off certain meds. And so they're, they're not gonna have a serotonin syndrome. So that also causes some behavior stuff with people. So if you go to like a random place out and wherever, you know, they often don't screen people. You know, some places do, but some, some shamans are, hey, you know, you're gonna give me your hundred bucks, come on in, drink, right? And, and those people might not be appropriate, whether it's emotionally appropriate or medically appropriate, they might not be. Mm-hmm. So everybody here has gone through a lot of sort of checks and balances to make sure that they're appropriate to drink ayahuasca. And the majority of that, not that it's, who cares who it is, but that's your orchestration, right? I mean, you think about all these checks and balances, mm-hmm. not even in the moments, even leading into it, am I consciously aware of all the support that's going on literally all around us? And certainly once you're involved in ceremony, yeah, I no fucking clue what's going on yeah, last exactly. night, right? Like <laughs> it's, there's so many levels of complexity to it. Yeah, there are, there are. That's Jerry's mastermind sort of business sense that he has. Mm-hmm. We have so many safety nets and so many control mechanisms to make sure everything runs really smooth and runs consistent. We want every single week here to be consistent with the way the protocols run and the way the staff handle stuff. So the guests can feel that when they're here and they can let go and they can just unleash whatever they need to unleash that's mm-hmm. troubling them. And there's all the support to help them. And so you've essentially seen yourself 5,000 people come through here just about. Yeah. Because everybody has to do their intake through you in some yep, capacity, exactly. right? exactly. Yep. That's so incredible to think 5,000 people. Yeah. It's in, wild. In just three, really three years. Yeah, three years. We have 5,000 guests and it's getting more crowded every week. Yeah, because there's, what, 60 or so here with me? Uh-huh. And that's, this is a slow week for us. We that's, often have 90. That's a lot of space to hold, man. It is. It that's, is. And you know what's interesting is our our success rate goes up the bigger the group. It's so counterintuitive. Energetically, because everybody's... That's our belief. Yeah. Energetically. And also, you know, if if you're like, you know, a handful of people a week are struggling with getting their their intention or their miracle, as we call it, Mm -hmm. if you got all these other people having a great experience, there's like this vibe of healing that kind of transfers to them. Yeah. You know, so they all kind of work together as a group. Yep. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's so interesting. Yeah, you would think, you know, some people, you know, some critics say, oh, you know, it, the bigger the group, the more crazy and out of control and hard to hold that it is. Well, maybe not for us, though. Not for us. We got to unlock. We, we can handle 90 plus people here. We've had it a lot and they've done awesome. And the miracle rate is the highest it's ever been when it's that size. So do they all fit inside the Maloka? Uh-huh. They nine? all fit. Yeah, wow. 96 fit there. That's the biggest group, 96? Yeah, 96. That's as many as we'll ever take. Okay. And they've all fit. Yeah. It's going to be tight in there. I mean, you know, you have a little room between your mattress, you know, like on each side. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty, you know, it's packed. Right. Yeah. Man, how exciting <laughs> that must be. We have an 11 to 1 ratio of uh, staff to guests up there. Mm-hmm. 
and you're in charge of, if I'm working up there, I got 11 guests. I'm just keeping tabs on the whole night. Yep. You know, and we have it divided up like that. So we have all these systems, you know, to make sure everybody's cool. Yeah, say behind the scenes, you guys have to have orchestrated this enough that everybody knows their zone, their section, who to watch out for, names. Yeah. So everybody here remembers everybody's name somehow. Like, yeah. I walk around, people are like, hey, Ryan. I'm like, how the yeah. fuck do you know my name? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We know everybody's name. We know where they come from. We know what they're dealing with to some degree. Mm-hmm. We know if they're here with family or friends or, you know, where, what part of the world they're from. Mm-hmm. We stay very, in, we're very interested in every single guest. We want to make sure they get what they came for, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and it shows, right? I mean, last night I was, as I shared with you pre-interview, I blasted off into God knows where, <laughs> right? First two times, not so much. This time yeah. I was out of my mind in the best way possible. Like, I yeah. loved every moment of it. And my purge was laughing. Right? Oh, like, nice. The whole time yeah, just, that's just good. laughing and touching things and like, man, yeah. this is phenomenal. Like, yeah. <laughs> this really blurred sp- sense of where am I at and what's going on, but realizing it doesn't much matter, I suppose. Yeah. But I have to get up and... Use a restroom, right? Just have to urinate. Uh-huh. No big deal. Sure. And so go to stand up and realize like, okay, I'm, a, I'm in, I'll call it, I'm in the control center. Like I know I have to get up and urinate, but this body is not going anywhere right yeah. now. <laughs> Staff helped me out. So, I mean, they was like out of nowhere. I, I was able to stand up and start walking out and somebody, I don't even know who it was, like held my hand and walked yep. me out and said, you know, hey, just take a couple deep breaths, center yourself, get in the grass. Yeah. Like, man, that was just beautiful because i'm even out there like i'm laughing as he i I know it was a he i don't know who again who it was but yeah just to have that be there yeah when really like i had no fucking clue what was going on in in the best way possible right yeah yeah yeah. there's so many gifts that come from this and as you're listening everyone's experience here so far has been different and unique but the same yeah it's a good way to say it like you, you, we we're sharing stories about w- what our breakthroughs were and, and the things that we're processing and what we saw or what we dealt with. Yeah. And my story has just been different than anybody else's, but they yeah. don't have to be the same. It's like this necessity to compare is, is so yeah phenomenally flawed to me. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has their own experience and their own journey, mm-hmm. you know, and, and like the, the way it's the same is everybody's just getting more self-awareness. Yeah, just plugged into themselves more because they're just getting connected. Mm -hmm. So there's all these different people's experiences in life, right? That makes everybody unique. And that part's like super cool. Everybody has their own story. But then the goal, right, is just to plug into yourself and heal your heart and show, see who you've become and who you show the world and why that's not your authentic self. Then plug into your soul and heal your heart and you're good to go. You know, so that's, that's what we're doing here every week. Yeah. And the power of doing that solo but also realizing that we're all one like yeah to feel the unity yeah like all of us are here like i've been here before yeah like it I, feels that way right yeah i know these people like yeah they had two or three people come up and say like, i know you from somewhere i'm like yeah, well, i feel the same i don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know <laughs> where when or how like certainly different parts of the globe even like these aren't people that are yeah i've certainly never ran into them in this physical life you know, what's interesting about the DMT, which is the active ingredient, right, is that our bodies produce DMT on its own. Mm-hmm. And so do most living, all pretty much all living things have some degree of DMT in them, plants and animals and us. And uh, there's different philosophies about what DMT is for. And some scientists believe that DMT is like our intuitive connection with things and our ability to kind of like feel other people and understand and be connected to the universe or in the environment. And so that's kind of like what our intuition is, I believe, is the DMT that we naturally have. But if you take a little extra DMT, which is what the plant medicine is, that becomes heightened and you feel really plugged in to that energetic sort of unseen vibe of just connection. I love it. Yeah. Like that, that just <laughs> such a, a brilliant way to depict what goes on. So, Jeff, what else is on the horizon for you? Like what else is going to go on? And Rhythmia, what are the things you want to grow, not even grow this into, right? But there's there's always the next. Yeah. Right? Jerry shared with me a couple of the new things that are they're coming out with the app and the connective nature of that and yeah. and some things that way. What do you see for you? What's what's going on with you? You know, I, I feel that like you know, I love talking to the guests and doing their intakes and working with them and you know, just being involved with the people and I train the staff a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I see myself probably, I don't know, you know, I, I'm so happy what I'm doing right now. I could do this for the rest of my life, you know, the exact same thing, but what I see myself doing probably, cause I just tend to do, you know, grow in certain things. 
I see myself, you know, being an advocate for plant medicine, you know, in the world, places where it's not legal Mm -hmm. to explain why it should be legal and what are the risks of it and how do you control for that? And just being more of like an advocate to get this thing, something that's, you know, more accessible to the world. Well, that makes so much sense. I mean, you've got 5,000 reps. You've got the protocol now built. Yeah. You've created a system that can be replicated. Yeah. With all the, the... The safety measures. That's right. So that's that's been our goal from the beginning. Like yeah. we really wanted to have something replicable mm-hmm. that has data collection component to it and that the guests self-report how they did at the end. And we collect that data and we can cookie cutter this, you know, anywhere we want in the world if it's, you know, acceptable to that country. So I just see myself, like I said, kind of just being a, a spokesperson for plant medicine because you know, if it would be wonderful if a shaman from Peru could go to the you know the DEA or the Feds or the United Nations and talk about plant medicine, but I don't know how much they're going to receive that necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but somebody like myself that has this certain kind of background academically and professionally, they just I think those types of rigid organizations tend to accept that a little bit more not always you know and maybe not even me <laughs> they might just laugh at me which would be fine i've been laughed at before but um i see myself having a unique sort of opportunity based on my degrees and my background in healthcare in la that i can be a good sort of advocate for this that's that's brilliant yeah i hope it happens we'll see i'll make it happen yeah <laughs> well i have no doubt i mean there's there's this whole you know i'll call it awakening happening yeah like I'll say the generation after me, right? I'm 35 and uh-huh. see the see, you know, kids not getting their driver's license yeah. and things of like understanding that certainly my parents' generation, yeah. not that they were flawed or broken. Yeah, they're just, just different. Only had what they had access to. Yeah, exactly. And then my generation getting the internet and having instant connectivity to everything and the amount yeah. of data and, and resources we have at our fingertips. Yeah. And then the next generation seeing like, man, there's just a better way to live to actually enjoy life and not just keep pushing all the time it's true it's like my daughter is 19 and she has no driver's license doesn't even care Mm -hmm. (laughs) and wants to make films and study pre-law and just have fun and cruise i mean she's hard worker studying her her ass off but it's a different way of it's just so different than the way i was at that age of course i was grinding out man i was just like i gotta get a job i gotta make money i'm screwed if not i'll be back in the hood (laughs) i started working at 14 right the minute i turned 16 like i was at the dmv getting my license yeah dude totally she'd get to work yeah exactly right. yeah my license was so i could go work (laughs) yes that is exactly right which is such a fallacy there too because right you you want to work and then you get the license to have to go to work to pay for the car and the insurance it's like Man, if I could have just slowed down a little bit back then. You know the the way that the way that uh, people get controlled, in my opinion, with the way governments control them or certain religions or or whatever, is that you just unplug people from themselves, get them to not be connected to themselves, get them to trust an outside source than themselves. Then they, you can manipulate them, you can guide them into other kind of consumerism and all kinds of crazy stuff. That becomes the norm. People think that I need to have this mansion. I need to have these homes. I need to, or this car or whatever. And the, the material stuff becomes very key to the to people's identity. And you know the the real way to control somebody is to let them be themselves because they can they can control themselves. Mm-hmm. We don't need to control anybody. It's absurd. It is. And the more unplugged people are, and the more unplugged the world is, the more it keeps going on this crazy path of destruction. But like you said, there's an awakening happening. People are plugging back into themselves. They're like, no, I'm not interested in this frilly crap that the government's telling me I need or these world leaders are BSing me about. It's just, it's stupid. And you know, people are pissed at the pharmaceutical industry, bottom line. People mm-hmm. are getting fed up with it. All these deaths with the opiate stuff. I mean, people are just getting sick of it. Yeah. You know, they're looking for a change, looking for something different. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the kind of people we get here. They're ready for a change, looking at something different. They've just had it with the system that's out there. Yeah, and you guys have a lot of success when it comes to treating, um, you know, um, drug dependency, alcohol dependency, right? Yeah, yeah. So much of that is able to be uh, fixed or solved, again, wrong terms. Sure. But Well, there's an underlying cause that people have addiction, Yeah. right, and alcohol abuse, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't think, you know, there's probably there's a few people that just drink because they like it and all of a sudden they're hooked and there's nothing per se wrong (laughs) but that's kind of rare most people drink in excess because they have some sort of underlying trauma 
or some issue they can't deal with or who knows, right? So it becomes a pattern. And so that's what this medicine does. This plant medicine plugs you in and gets you to resolve what that stuff is. It goes to the core issue. And if my core issue is resolved, I don't need to drink myself into oblivion to feel better. I just feel better naturally. That's it. Yeah. It, it's it's crazy how overcomplicated we make everything look, <laughs> really when it's just so simple. It is. It's real simple. Like, you know, my, my experience with plant medicine the first time is very simple. It's like... I had to protect myself as a kid. I had to become a tough guy. That's not my true self. I'm really a nice, loving person. Boom. That's not some sort of brain surgery thing. <laughs> no, it's, it's like opening that sense of awareness right yeah. for yourself. And right. actually feeling it. Yeah. People could have told me that all day and I wouldn't, it wouldn't have connected with me. I would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I get it, but whatever. But to feel it, to get rid of those emotional histories and to really plug into who you are as a person, that is what makes a change. Absolutely does. Yeah. Jeff, I appreciate you so much for spending time with me today. My pleasure. Thanks for talking to me. I appreciate it too. Yeah, I love hearing the story. love hearing what, what you do. And thanks again. No problem. I hope, hope all you guys that are listening will check out Rhythmia. It's a, it's a good place to come on a vacation. <laughs> it is. A vacation is certainly one way to describe what the, goes on at Rhythmia. Vacation that is a lot of work, but well worth the time. 100% worth yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Yep. <laughs>